Luke 19, 5. You all look so good. Look like you're ready to worship. Hear the word. Wow, God has been awesome already today to us. He's always awesome. We don't always feel it. We don't always experience it. But today we've already had an opportunity. Luke 19, verse 5. It says, And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. Verse 8, Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house, for, for so much as he also is a son of Abraham. For so much as he also is a son of Abraham. I want to preach on the subject. Some people just know how to get to him. Some people just know how to get to him. Lord, I ask you once again, God, we have prayed so many times today, but we have so believe in it. We ask that you just touch our minds, God. Let it come, let the word come through the filter of our desire to you. Let it affect us, let it cause change in our lives. Prepare us, make us more like you. Prepare us for that soon coming day when the trumpet shall sound. God, the dead in Christ shall rise, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them to meet you in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. In Jesus' name. God bless you. You may be seated. Thank you to all of our elders that were there yesterday. We went over to the West Chicago Church to help them to dedicate their new building unto the Lord. There was such a powerful presence of God there. There was such a unity. There was such compassion and faith. And we had such a great time in the Lord. Uh, not to mention that the food was really good too. <clears throat> At the scripture, my opening scripture, um, the Bible says that he came to a certain place and looked up and saw Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus had gone there, and the Bible tells us that Zacchaeus was short of stature, so he was trying to get, a, get an opportunity to see him. He was trying to get an opportunity to get a glimpse, and because of his stature and because of all the people that were there, he decided to climb a tree. Some people just know how to get to him question that God has for you today is, what will you do? What would you do to get to him? Something inside of Zacchaeus uh, was lacking. He knew that something was missing. He had all that a person could possibly want. He had the safety, the provision, he had the position, he had the finance. He had everything that you really would need to survive, to continue your Life And yet something inside of him caused him to want to go and get closer to Jesus, try to get a glimpse, try to get an experience with him. And so he goes there and he climbs a tree. I, I'm, I'm not sure that was his original intent. It doesn't say that he brought his spurs on the side, those little things, those boots. I have some for cl climbing trees that you put the stay and you can, cl you can shimmy up the tree. I don't know that he had those. Uh, in fact, the sycamore tree, as I had preached before, it had very low branches, so it would have been very easy for him to climb that tree. But the, pro the, 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 the point that I'm trying to make is there was something inside of him that caused him to do something out of the ordinary, to get to him, something out of the ordinary, just to flat out get a glimpse of him. And by the time he was done with that out-of-the-box reaction, Jesus said, I must abide at thy house. Today, I must abide at thy house. In verse 8, as I read, the Bible says that Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, the half of my goods I give to the poor. Something changed. Something changed as a result of his response to the Lord. He went out of the box to 
get closer to him, to have an experience with him. And he ends up saying, half of what I have, I'm going to give to the poor. Jesus said, this day of salvation come to this house, which we preached. I have a question. Some people met him on the street. They met him as he passed by. They watched him. They stopped and tried to challenge him and catch him in his words. Others were sitting there as he taught and ate of the loaves and the fishes that he provided for them. And they received from him. They, they came in multitudes and received miracles and signs and wonders. But I noticed something different about this scripture yesterday. The Bible says, Jesus said, I, went, I must abide at thy house. And when he got there, he said, this day is salvation, come to your house. And Zacchaeus changed his approach to living that day. He didn't just meet him on the street. He didn't just have an encounter during worship like we just did. We didn't just come for the loaves and the fishes. Zacchaeus brought him all the way home, Keith. He brought him home. That's what you did Wednesday night. He didn't just come to church. He didn't just come to the field to listen to his teaching. Jesus said, I want to come home with you today. And Zacchaeus said, yes, sir. I want you to come home with me. And he brought him all the way home. When Zacchaeus got Jesus into his house, his priorities changed. We can have an experience with him sitting in this building, and it can be awesome, and it can be, it can be an encounter with God that we may have never even had before. It may even be like what we had before, but just far more intense, maybe a little different. Maybe God did a little different miracle in our lives. But this circumstance, Zacchaeus got him all the way home. Are you willing to bring him all the way home with you today. The Bible says that when Jesus went to church, he went to the temple and there were things happening in the temple that he didn't approve of. There was some corrupt money changing going on and some corrupt sacrificial things that were happening at the temple and he made a whip out of he made a whip, a cat of nine tails, and he, he was chasing people, corrupt things out of the temple and kicking over the tables. And I'm glad when Jesus comes to church, usually. But when he starts kicking over my table and starts running things out, I want Jesus to come to church because there are things that he won't accept. There are things that he won't approve of. Many times that's why we don't want to bring him to our house because there are things in our house that we don't necessarily want him to run out. But Zacchaeus that day brought him all the way home and there was a desire in his heart. I want you to come to my house and when he did, my life is changing. I am, I am not going to rip people off anymore. In fact, I'm going to give half of what I have to the poor. I'm going to restore people. I'm going to give back what I stole. I want you. And Jesus said, yes, salvation has come. To your house. It didn't just come to you in the church. It came to your house. It came to your house. The Bible says you are the temple of the Holy Ghost. Don't leave him at church. Don't leave him. Don't be different at home than you are at church. Come around the altar and we worship and we weep and cry and we dance and shout and then we go home and curse and swear and tell dirty stories and put rotten things in our spirit. And Jesus is saying, you didn't take me home with you. You left me at church. You just jumped and shouted and worshiped me and you went home and left, left me there. That's what happened to Joseph and Mary that day. They went into the city and they ended up traveling out of the city and all of a sudden, she says, hey, have you seen Jesus lately? Uh, not lately. Have you? I thought he was with you. No, he's not with me. Where is he? 
They looked in all of the entourage in which they were traveling with, and they said, he's not with us. It's very easy to travel to a religious place and end up walking away without him. They went back to the city. They inquired, and guess where they found him? In church. They, found, they left him in church. <laughs> wow, what a great example. Okay, can you move on? Okay, I will, I'll move on. He never intended for us to associate him with a building. Although he expects you to be here, he doesn't intend you to associate him with just the building. He wants you to take him home with him. <clears throat> hmm. Hallelujah. In Mark chapter 5, verse 27, there was a woman that was very sick. And she had heard of Jesus. And the Bible says she came in the press behind and touched the hem of his garment. The story goes on that you know she was she was sick, she was dying, she was losing blood profusely every day and couldn't replace it fast enough and she had had sought the doctors to try to find a remedy for her malady and couldn't find it. She had given up everything she had. She had lost her family, lost community, lost all of her money, and then she tried Jesus be nice if we just try him first, give that a shot, and then work on the rest of the stuff. We always try everything else first. But she reached through and touched the hem of his garment, and as soon as she did, she knew inside of herself, she said, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, I'll be made whole. And the moment she touched the hem of his garment, virtue flowed out of him, healed her body, and Jesus felt that happen. He turned, he said, who touched me? And the disciples looked at him like he was crazy. He said, there are thousands of people around you, and you're asking who touched you? And he said, nah, somebody touched me with faith. See, you can just be in the house of God, and you can be close to him, and, but, but, but to touch him causes virtue to flow, a desire to do something out of the ordinary. Somebody. There were lots of people that just wanted to say, oh, I just want to touch you. Let me take my handkerchief and rub the sweat of your brow. No. People do that. They did that with Elvis all the time. He would take these handkerchiefs and rub his sweat and throw it into the crowd. And people would just swoon and idolize him. And people wanted to just see him. They wanted to touch him. But this woman was different. This woman touched him with faith. Something inside her said, if I can touch him, I'll be healed. So something out of the ordinary. No, somebody touched me with faith. Something can happen. God is trying to talk to somebody today. She tried everything. People swindled her. Doctors said, yes, I can help you. Took her money and had no idea what to do with her problem. Friends had rejected her according to the law. Her family had to push her away. And religiosity, so to speak, her relationship with God had to be diminished because she couldn't come to the temple. She couldn't even come into the outer court where the women stood. Couldn't be a part of it. Have you given up? You've prayed before? The Bible says that she had done everything she knew to do and she was none the better. She had only gotten worse. Has your circumstance seemed to have gotten worse over the years to the point where you're not willing to reach out and touch the hem of his garment anymore? You've just given up. You said, I don't know even know why I bother. Or knowing that he's here today, he's not done with me yet. He's walking down the aisles of the church. He's waiting for somebody to simply reach out and touch him with faith. How many times was that man laid by the gate? How many times did he sit there as the disciples, as the apostles moved in and out of the sanctuary, came walking past? How many times did people come by and give him a few quarters for the day, a little bit of money for the day? If it would have been you, you would have just given up and said, forget it. Why should I even bother? Yet Peter and John come by and they say, silver and gold have I none. But such as I have, give I thee. Reached and picked him up. And a person who was lame most or all of his life ended up receiving strength in his ankles that day and began to walk. He didn't give up. He said, I'm going to try again. People may have taken advantage of him, may have stole the money. There are just some people that know how to get to him. 
God knows. Yes, He does. He knows everything that you've said and done. He knows everything that you think. God knows. Then why do you continue to have the circumstance, the conflict that you have? Because some people just know how to get to Him. Some people climb trees. Some people run to the altar. Some people press through a crowd. They don't care what people think. See, a lot of people in 12 years, probably everybody knew that she was unclean. I read, it actually says that if you look, at, if you look up the word issue of blood, if you look that up, it's in the Old Testament. If a person has an issue of blood, they must be separated for seven days. If it continues, they must be separated from the people like a leper. You are indefinitely unclean. You can't associate with people. The Bible says it in the law. You have to do that. Yet, she kept pressing. She said, I don't care what you th- I need him. I am going to do something out of the ordinary. I know how to get to him. I just need to touch the hem of his garment. Why is it that we do the same thing that we always do and expect different results. These people knew how to get to him. The Bible doesn't say Zacchaeus climbed a tree every time Jesus came by. He just decided, today's my day. I'm going to do something different. That woman, how often did she hear about the healing power of Jesus Christ? That day, she said, I'm going to get to him today. I am going to get, I'm going to get under his nerves. I am, I am going to get his attention today because today's my day of healing. The hmm. Bible says in Mark chapter 2, verse 3, And they come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they decided to come back when there weren't so many people there. They decided to try to get a private conversation and meeting with Jesus. They decided to press through the... No, they didn't. They decided to take the hardest route to get to him. They decided to climb. They decided to walk up the uh, the stairway and get on top of the roof. They decided that what they wanted was inside the building and they couldn't do it. So they didn't give up. They decided that we're going to find a way to get to him. We're going to get to him. We're going to find a way to get to him. And they tore the roof off and they lowered him into the presence of Jesus Christ. They knew that if they could get him into the presence of Jesus Christ, they weren't polite about it. They climbed before they lowered. They decided it was worth Carrying this lame man up the stairs. Well, God wouldn't want us to. Why do we talk ourselves out of it? Why don't you just do what it takes to get to him? Why don't you just make, why don't you just make your way to him? What, climb stairs. Lower yourself on a rope through the roof. Do whatever it takes to get into his presence. It, it all depends on whether you want to walk away, change, or whether you want to walk away the same. It's entirely up to us. They uncovered the roof where he was, and when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. It was difficult for them. It was difficult to get this man in the presence of God. The other part about this story is sometimes people can't do it themselves. Well, I'll just talk to God myself. Well, good luck. This guy could have done that. Why couldn't he have done it? He needed somebody to help him. There are circumstances where you don't have the ability. Maybe your faith has dwindled to the point where you don't have enough faith to get out of bed. You don't have enough faith to come to the house of God. You don't have enough faith to pray and submit unto his power. You need four people to grab hold of the four corners of your life and lower you into the presence of God. And when you do... 
God knows all things. God knew this man had a problem with walking. God knew that that man couldn't get close to him. And God said, I just want to see what they'll do. I'm going to make sure they try to get to me. I want them to do something to get to me. I'll give them the power that they need. Jesus looked at that man and said, that you might know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sin. I'm going to say to this man, get up and walk. He said, I have power to forgive sin. Only God has power to forgive sin. There's a whole other message in that. If Jesus forgave that man's sin, then that means he's God. If he's not God, then you can tear that page out of the Bible because it doesn't mean anything. But God said all of his word has been preserved. What will you do? Some people knew how to get to him. What does it take? Well, I don't want to be lowered from the roof. People will look at me. They'll, they'll look at me funny. What's the matter with you? What are you doing? That poor guy's house. I mean, imagine that. Ruin the roof tiles of the house. I don't know if insurance would cover that or not. I'm not sure. In John chapter 7... <laughs> It's alluding to something that happened in John chapter 3. In John chapter 3, the Bible says there was a man by the name of Nicodemus. He was like the third most wealthy person in all Jerusalem. And he came to Jesus by night. It says that. It says he came to Jesus by night and began to ask him questions. And Jesus began to expound. And it's funny. He said, you know, there's no way you could do what you do unless you be sent of God. And he began to butter him up and compliment him. And Jesus just looked at him and and said, except a man be born again, he can't see or enter, enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus didn't care how religious the man was. He didn't care what kind of experience he had. He didn't care how knowledgeable he was about the scriptures. He just simply said, except you be born again of water and spirit, you won't enter the kingdom of heaven. He came by night. Why did he come by night? I'm, you know, my creative brain just kind of wandered a little bit and I thought was he just walking down the street and happened to see Jesus sitting sitting at a at a at a coffee booth outside what, what how did he run did he set an appointment with Jesus ahead of time or did he just seek him out in the middle of the night under the cover maybe wore a dark shroud and just made his way through the crowd didn't want to be seen and got a hold of Jesus and said I need to talk to you and I don't know. It doesn't really tell us. It just says that he came to him by night. And I thought it was interesting that in John chapter 7, the Bible says, Nicodemus saith, saith unto them, parentheses, he that came to Jesus by night. Notice that? I want to make sure you get the Nicodemus right. This was the guy who snuck through the darkness of the night to get to Jesus. That's the guy I'm talking about. Why did he say that? God doesn't do that unless he wants to get our attention to something. He said, this is the guy that came to Jesus by night. What was he doing here? It says, doth our law judge any man before it hear him and know what he doeth? Nicodemus began to protect the people of God. He began to make a case and say, hey, how come you guys are falsely accusing these people? This Nicodemus, one of the rulers of the Jews, he was like a Pharisee. And, and, and it was like, all of a sudden, this guy who met with Jesus, now he's starting to defend. Hey, you, you can't judge him before you get all of the facts. What do, you, what do you think you're doing? And then in chapter 19, verse 39, And there came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night. What happened to this guy? Some people know how to get to him. But it says this, he came to Jesus by night and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pound weight. Then took they, they, who's they? Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, they took the body of Jesus and wound it in linen clothes with the spices as the manner of the Jews is to bury. This man that got to Jesus at night, in the middle of the night. We find him defending, and then we find him involved 
in scooping up the body, of, the dead body of Jesus Christ, ministering to that dead body. He was there. No hiding. No more covering over his face. I brought things for him. I'm here. I want to be a part of it. Nicodemus went from hiding in the shadows to standing in front of everyone. I'm going to minister to the body of Jesus Christ. Some people, see, we can change. We can take how we respond to him and we can change. If we'll do something out of the ordinary, what caused him to seek out Jesus in the middle of the night? I don't know. Maybe his schedule was full and he just couldn't get to him until the sun went down. I don't know. But the fact that it mentions it at least three times in the Bible tells us something changed. This is the guy who was afraid to associate with Jesus. And now he's requesting his body. In Luke chapter 8, we have a man by the name of Jairus. In the Bible tells us that his only daughter was dying, about 12 years old. And it says, Behold, there came a man named Jairus, and he was a ruler of the synagogue. So he, had a, he was a man of position, and he fell down at Jesus' feet. Well, there's a miracle already. Somebody who has position and power, and he's bowing at the feet of Jesus. And he besought him that he would come to his house because he had one daughter and <clears throat> she was about 12 years old and she lay a dying. But as he went, the people thronged him so that it's like the, the crowd just pressed upon him. And this is where in verse 43 that that woman having an issue of blood 12 years which had spent all her living. I thought that was kind of cool the fact that this woman was sick like the same year this daughter was born. She spent all her living upon the physicians, neither could be healed of any. I told the story about how this woman got healed, but this man had one daughter and he came to Jesus. As he was trying to get his help, please, he was bowing at his feet, please come to my house, my daughter's dying, my only daughter, she's dying. The crowd presses on him and this woman touches him and he turns, who touched me? Virtue has flowed out of me and daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. That whole circumstance and the guy is just, my daughter's dying, my daughter's dying. Please, please come. You know, we can take care of that later. She's had this problem for 12 years. You can minister to that later. He turns around and ministers to this woman in the midst of a man requesting life-saving issues with his daughter and all of a sudden, while this was happening, while he yet spake to her, there cometh one from the ruler of the synagogue's house. So Jairus, someone came from Jairus' house and said, your daughter just died. Don't trouble him. There are times when we hear a doubtful statement that comes from people, maybe even of our own house maybe even of this house. There are things that we believe God for, and yet a word comes to us and says, your promise has died. Don't trouble the master. Don't ask him anymore. And I really like what happened next. Don't trouble Jesus. But when Jesus heard it, he overheard the words of doubt, and he answered him saying, fear not. Believe only, and she shall be made whole. Jesus knew that words of doubt can be like poison in the hearts of people. Negative, negative words can be like poison. And if it's not addressed by Jesus, it can literally take away your promise. It can kill your promise. You need to be careful what you listen to. This man... She's dead. Jesus said, don't listen to that. Only believe, and she shall be made whole. Jesus went to the house, and he said, all these hired mourners were there. And, and he said, 
Stop doing that. She's only asleep. And they laughed him to scorn. And he looked at Peter and John. Get him out of the house. I want the doubt to leave. Anyone who doubts me. Doubts my power. Doubts my authority. Get him out. I don't want him in here. I don't know that it would have stopped him. But I think he just didn't want them to see it. I don't want you to be a part of this miraculous happening. That's a, I don't want you to see me raise her up from the dead. You doubt me like that. I don't know. But Jesus raised her from the dead and gave her back. All because some people just know how to get to him. He came all the way from his house. He came all the way from where he lived he left his dying daughter to get to Jesus and allowed the distraction of the miraculous to delay to the extent his daughter died. I'm not so sure I would be so full of faith if that happened. I need a miracle. You stepped in the way and you got healed and then he comes and says, by the way, your daughter's dead. It's your fault. You stole my miracle. I don't know. Imagine that. Come on. You're my answer. You've got mir miraculous power. I need you to come to my house. And somebody distracts you for their own need. And now mine fell apart. What are you going to do? Jesus, in another gospel, said, look at me. He's looking at doubt. Your daughter's dead. Look at me. We need to change our focus. If you're not getting what you need, probably need to change your focus. Maybe change the frequency of what you're listening to. In Matthew chapter 8, the Bible says, And when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion. He was a Roman ruler of military, beseeching him and says, Lord, my servant lieth at home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. Sounds bad. Jesus said, I'll come and heal him. And the centurion answered and said, Lord, I'm not worthy that thou shouldest come unto my roof, but speak the word only and my servant shall be healed. Jesus said, I've not seen such great faith, no, not in Israel. He said, you've just displayed so much faith, be it unto you. And the servant was healed from that selfsame hour. The report came, and it was like, um, how, how's the servant doing? Oh, they're up, they're up and at him, man. They're, they're completely healed. What time did that happen? Same time he was talking to Jesus. Do you trust his authority? Do you trust the fact that he doesn't even need to physically be on site? Do you trust that you can just simply trust him and believe in his power? And see the miraculous. That's what he was doing here. He simply showed up in the building in the spirit. People began to respond to him. And, and start to believe him. And submit to his power. And repent for things. Clear my brain out God. All the things in my heart. Clear out my heart so that I can. That I can fit more of you. And you can be more comfortable. In me. Hmm. Lastly, we have Luke chapter 7, verse 37. The Bible says the woman, there was a woman in the city which was a sinner. And when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house. Notice when God gives specifics, it's important. He said we have a woman. It doesn't say was a sinner, it says is. Or it says was, but she was a sinner. It's like this woman is a woman of the night. 
There are three different gospels that mention it. It says, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, a religious man, very religious. So she's about to walk into a very religious home. She brought an alabaster box of ointment and stood at his feet behind him weeping. The Bible talks about these men, all of these important people sitting at meat in another one of the gospels. And it talks about them looking at her like, who does she think she is? She wasn't invited to this party. Not only that, but she, she's a sinner. What, if he knew who she was, he wouldn't even talk to her, much less let her touch him. She poured, in one gospel, she poured the ointment on his head. Another one, it says it was on his feet. And another one says she was bowing before him and the tears were falling on him. It's all part of the same story. So she poured it on his head. It dripped down onto his feet and she was down worshiping him and tears were falling upon his feet and she wiped his feet with her hair. All this was happening and we see it in verse 38 and stood at his feet behind him weeping and began to wash his feet with tears and wipe them with the hairs of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. So it was the tears, it was the ointment, it was all encompassing and now when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, he spoke within himself. This man, if, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is. Notice the difference? The Bible says she was a sinner, and he said she is a sinner. Hmm. Many say that this probably was the woman that had seven demons in her, and Jesus cast them out which means she would have now been free. She would have now been ready. She would have been clear of all of her past. That's very possibly what happened. Notice this. Jesus said, he's sitting in the midst of religious people. If you knew, if you were really a prophet, you'd know that she's a sinner. And Jesus told the story. He told the story about a man who owed a lot and was forgiven. And there was a man that didn't owe a lot. And he was forgiven. He said, who would be more grateful? He said, it's the man that had all this stuff and couldn't even pay it. But that's the guy that would be really grateful. He said, that's this woman. He said, I came into your house. You didn't wash my feet like the custom is. You didn't anoint my head with oil. You didn't greet me properly. You ignored me just because of my name and the fact that I'm important in, this, in, the, in the community. And this woman hasn't stopped worshiping me. She, she washed my feet with her tears and wiped it with her hair. She poured the oil upon. This is all custom. He said, she did all of that because to whom much is given. God said, I forgave her much. And therefore, she's really thankful. He indicted them. And he said unto her, thy sins are forgiven thee. Because some people just know how to get to him. What is your past like? Does your past restrict you? You walk amongst some people who know about your past. Does it stop you from entering a room of religious? Does it stop you from getting to, people, getting to the one that can heal you? What about your physicalities? Short of stature, are you afraid to climb a tree as people may look at you? You may become a spectacle. What about the woman with the issue of blood that may have given up all and decided that this was her last chance and probably shaking as she reached toward him? I don't know about you, but you lose enough blood, your strength. People begin to shake and tremble and become delirious. You willing to climb on top of a, roof of a building and tear off the roof to get to him? Or are you willing to go home and wait for a more convenient time? Are you used to coming to him secretly, praying secretly? Or are you willing to come to him in the middle of the day and say, I brought spices. I came to anoint the body. See, some people will only do something for the body when it can do something for them. 
But Nicodemus was willing to do something for the body of Christ when it couldn't return the favor. He was dead. That shows true love. Are we willing to be selfless when it comes to the kingdom of God? Or are some people put in a hundred, get back a thousand? Some people serve God for the principles. Major CEOs never attend church, but they tithe because they say, God blesses me. Look at my company. My company's been growing by 20, 30% a year. I only have to give 10. There are CEOs that say that. J.C. Penney was one of the first that I knew. He said, yeah, I don't go to church. He said, but I tithe. He said, look at my company. Growing by leaps and bounds. I'm a multi, multi, multi millionaire. All because I honor the biblical principle. The centurion, are you willing? Your position of power and authority, you're willing to bow at his feet? Are you willing to grab what's really important to you, like the woman with the alabaster box? Saved. Someone said that that was probably a year's salary. I don't know for sure. I wasn't there. But it was, it, the Bible does say it was extremely precious and pricey. Spikenard, it was one of the most expensive perfumes of the day mixed with oil. Hmm. What about the demoniac? Filled with spirits. Cast out of the city. Lived in a grave. A cave, really. I'm sure there were dead bones. There were just old, decrepit bones in there. That, the stench of dead bodies. Cut himself. Chains that people had tried to subdue him. Hungry, cold, naked. Crying out in the middle. The Bible says that he cried out. Talk about a miserable life. You think you have it bad? But Jesus said, I got to go across the sea. There's somebody that needs me. And when he got off that ship, the demoniac came running to him. Some people just know how to get to him. Some people just know how. First time I walked into a church like this, I saw all the people. And I just hid in the back row. Never moved, never lift my hands. But the next time I came into church, I didn't notice the people. Didn't realize that the church was filled with people. I heard the message from Brother Mackey. And just came wandering down the aisle. Didn't care. I would have climbed a tree. I would have pressed through the crowd. I would have bowed at his feet. I just didn't care. I just needed to get to him. I needed to do whatever it took to get to him. The forgiveness that I felt that day, the power of forgiveness was enough to cause me to throw away my cigarettes that day, to dump out all the booze that I owned in the house, to throw away any drugs that I had that day and never go back. The power, because of a simple response, I got to get to him. Whatever I have to do, I want my life to change. And what you need to remember is Zacchaeus had what we would say a successful life, but it wasn't enough. The woman with the issue of blood had run out of options. The centurion, with all of his authority and power, knew that his authority wasn't enough to save his servant. Jairus knew, I need to travel to get to Jesus. My daughter, even though he was a ruler in the synagogue, it didn't matter. You see, it doesn't matter. To, Jesus doesn't look at positions. He looks at simple people that try to get to him. If you'll try to get to him, he's got an answer for you. And then we look 
the ten lepers rejected, forbidden to approach. Yet they made their way to Jesus. People all around them would have cried out, unclean, you need to stay away. Unclean, you need to not come. And Jesus is like, come on, go show yourself. Jesus sends them away healed. Jesus didn't turn them away. See, their lives were over. There was nothing left. They were hopeless. There was no healing for that day. There was no medication they could take. They simply put him in a separate little village to rot away and die. That's what their future looked like. But Jesus said, go to the priest. Hmm. The Bible says that the multitudes came and he healed them all. They made their way to Jesus. Wow. There was a mighty move of God in the worship service today. But there's a few things right now that are still hanging there. You're just saying that, oh no, I feel it in the spirit. I've touched upon hopelessness. I've tried it. I've prayed and nothing happens. I got my focus on authority and position. I ran out of money. I've already been to the religious and they can't help me. The only thing my people could do was put chains around me and try to keep me from hurting somebody. Hopeless. Rejected. Betrayed. When Jesus knew it, he withdrew himself from thence and great multitudes followed him and he healed them all. He healed them all. He healed mental problems. He healed physical problems. He healed spiritual problems. He healed every... It says he healed them all. There's nothing he can't do. Would you stand with me today? Joel chapter 3 in verse 14, I can't even remember why this came up. I think I was simply looking at, I was looking up the scripture for multitudes came and followed him and he healed them all. And this popped up. I was scrolling through and he healed them all. Jesus said, greater things than these shall you do. Greater. And if, they came, if the multitudes came and he healed them all, what would be his intention? I would say that he definitely has the ability. I wouldn't say this is multitudes. The Bible says there were multitudes that came and he healed them all. But in Joel 3, 14, it says multitudes... Multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. I don't recall ever reading that scripture before. I'm sure I have because I've read the Bible through, but multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. And then he said, For the day of the Lord is near. In the valley of decision. The only thing I know that that could mean. Is that destiny. Is decided. In the valley. Of decision. It has to be. Because he said the day of the Lord is near. In the valley of decision. So when people are sitting here. Trying to decide. What do I do? I care about what people look at me and think. I care what they hear. I care. Destiny is decided in the valley of decision. Choose this day. Choose. He wants to continue what he was doing in this altar. 
if you'll come and just begin to worship, he can handle every remedy, every problem, every malady. He can handle fear. He's the best psychologist there ever will be. He can speak words into your spirit that will change Zacchaeus had everything he needed. But Zacchaeus decided Jesus wanted him to come to his house. Jesus wanted to come all the way to his house. Don't leave him here today. Don't leave him here. Take him home. Jesus said, I will never leave you in the Old Testament. I will never leave you nor forsake you. He didn't. We left him. You can leave him. He won't leave you, but you can leave him. What that tells me is we come to where he is, and he comes home with us. But we can leave him. Take him home. even though he might do something strange in your home. He might rearrange the furniture. Lord, whatever it takes, I want to be one of those that know how to get to you. I want to know how to get to you. What do I have to do? Climb a tree? bring ointment, bow. What do I need to do to get your attention? Reach for the hem of your garment. Do I need to speak out your authority? Oh, you don't have to come to my house. I recognize authority. Just say it, Lord. And I believe it. Come on, that's it. What does it take? What does it take to get to him? Make a decision today. Get out of the valley of decision. The day of the Lord comes for every one of us as we make that decision. Come on, what is he asking for? Have you tried to serve him secretly in the middle of the night? God brought Nicodemus out into the open. He said, if you're ashamed of me, I'll be ashamed of you. Ha, scriptures just keep flooding my brain. Oh, Lord, I am not ashamed of you. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of your name. minister let's minister to him first and then as virtue begins to flow let's minister to others there's some things there's some deep things that need to happen today the day of the Lord can come in the valley come on the Lord led me to that scripture was not looking it up didn't even know about it higher than Reach out to him right now. I know your way. I know your way. Hallelujah. I know your way. 
Come on in the valley. In the valley. In the valley. Let me make a decision today. Come on, Jesus said to blind Bartimaeus, rise and go, for he calleth to thee. There's a decision to make. It says he got up and cast away his garments and made his way to Jesus. Always decisions in the valley. Hallelujah. Stop the naysay. Stop the doubt. You are not Look upon me, me, Jesus said. Don't listen to those people you that only talk negative. Hallelujah. I need a miracle now. I, I need a miracle now. You are 